Well, thank you very much for coming to see uh, an unannounced talk, which uh, is my fault. I thought I'd given the organizers the title at lunchtime, um, and it didn't go on the web. So I'm amazed that so many people have turned up to see this. And uh, something I should clarify about my introduction, uh, for the past nine years, I have been chief privacy advisor for Microsoft in Europe. And I'm only going to be doing that job for another two weeks. And after that, I'm going to be going back to probably doing something in privacy advocacy in civil society. I haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, so these remarks are definitely not made on behalf of Microsoft. I'm here on holiday. I'm not representing Microsoft. So what I'm going to try and do in this talk is give you a crash course kind of oral history of uh, what I think some of the significant developments are to have happened, uh, particularly in Europe, on laws governing internet surveillance. Uh, I've been involved in this really since the issue of key escrow in the mid-1990s, the idea that you shouldn't be allowed to use encryption unless you give government a copy of the key first. And from 1998 to 2002, um, I co-founded the, I guess, the main British uh, internet advocacy group, um, something like EPIC or EFF in the United States, uh, which was trying to um, maybe bring some technical enlightenment to the laws that were being passed then. And by way of introduction, I mean, a lot of what I have to say will be talking about British laws and the British situation. Uh, and I'm afraid to say that is because much of the, uh, what I regard as being the bad ideas in internet surveillance policy have actually come from the UK or happened in the UK first. So with that uh, uh, apology for the bias of content, I'll begin. I'm not going to go through all of this slide, but what I wanted to do on one, one slide was to give um, a very quick idea of just how old the idea of privacy regulation in law is right at the top, grayed, grayed out, there's a very famous case at English common law called Entick versus Carrington, which really established the principle that you cannot have, in this case, messengers on behalf of the king breaking down your door, ransacking through all of your papers just in case they find something incriminating. It was out of that case that in British law was established the idea that to search through somebody's papers, you need a specific warrant. You need a description of what you're looking for. You need some standard of prior suspicion. So you can see through uh, the history of this, we get the establishment of the European Convention of Human Rights, Article 8, uh, that privacy uh, should not be subject to arbitrary interference by the state in 1950. Now there are 50 countries that are signatories to that European Convention Treaty. It's a much bigger deal than the European Union. The first proper data protection law uh, established in the German state of Hesse, uh, and then the first national law in Sweden, and moving through some of the uh, other uh, development of data protection law, uh, leading up to the current consultations on revising the main European data protection directive, which I'm sure you've all read about, those discussions happening now in Brussels, probably going to result in some new legislative proposals sometime maybe in the autumn. At the same time, there's a history of laws governing covert mass surveillance. Covert meaning that it's not publicly known, at least in detail, the sort of surveillance that's being undertaken. Mass surveillance, because the objective is not to investigate a particular case, a particular criminal suspect. The objective of the law is to gather information about thousands or millions of people at once. Um, I will only pick out certain uh, highlights here, but grayed out, there is obviously now a very famous history from the Second World War about Ultra, the Enigma machine, and the success that was had in breaking those ciphers. And I suppose one tendentious thesis that I want to advance on why UK policy, British policy, is perhaps so blinkered in some respects, is I do think there's a sort of psychological hangover in British policy from that time of the Second World War, where for 30 years, nobody talked about the existence of this uh, large-scale ability to get intelligence from encrypted communications. 
But in Britain, we had our first proper law governing the interception of communications as late as 1985. It had actually been the practice uh, to give warrants to authorize interception of telephones since the 1950s, but this was not publicly known. And it was only through Britain losing a case at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg in 1984, a famous case called Malone, that actually forced the UK government to introduce the first law to put this on a statutory basis in 1985. In 2000, uh, the UK passed its current major surveillance law called the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, RIPA. And that was what I spent most of my time on when I was campaigning in civil society uh, for my little think tank, the Foundation for Information Policy Research. Um, in the past decade, we've obviously had major scandals in the United States about the so-called warrantless wiretapping affair. And I'm going to say quite a bit more about that. So why worry? Why is this an interesting subject to consider? Don't lawyers worry about this? Don't lawyers figure out that we have constitutional and procedural safeguards to stop these powers being abused by the state? Well, it's obvious that the formulation of the main constitutional and human rights safeguards in every country predated the internet, but also predated the ability to conduct mass surveillance of the internet through trawling with supercomputers. And I think that the past 15 years of policy history has shown some very, very sharp dilemmas. Do you want a system of key escrow where government essentially rounds up all the encryption keys beforehand? Uh, or do you do some other measure to try and create a legal power to require people to tell the authorities the key if they are a suspect of an investigation? Uh, do we want to follow a philosophy of surveillance by design or privacy by design? And what do those words mean anyway? Uh, do we want to have a methodology of traffic data retention, where, as we do tragically today in Europe, we retain data about the communications of 500 million people just in case there might need to be some inquiry into what those people were doing or communicating? Or do we try and have a targeted power which identifies some category of suspects within the population and we only collect data about those pre-designated suspects? And then there are sudden new phenomena that we weren't even thinking about 10 years ago, notably the rise of social networks, the importance of location data and mobile platforms, but most importantly, cloud computing. Cloud computing is a very vague phrase, uh, but it turns out that we don't actually need to get too specific about what we mean by cloud computing, because guess what? The laws authorizing surveillance of cloud computing have already been passed. So my claim is that normal democratic checks and balances don't appear to be working in this area of covert policy making of mass surveillance. Knowledge is power, and those very few people within governments who understand this policy are able, and I suggest have, manipulated policymakers to achieve the laws that they want without really very good public or parliamentary understanding of what has happened. So I've mentioned already the UK law on internet surveillance, the Regulation Investigatory Powers Act. The rough structure of that is part one deals with interception of, of content, or the first part of part one. Then there's a section on powers to access traffic data, communications data, that is not the content, but data about who you're talking to or which websites you may be browsing. Part three um, was until recently fairly unique in the UK. These are powers which attempt to provide a legal procedure to compel you to disclose a key or a password. And part four deals with procedures for making complaints and who is going to be overseeing the use of these powers. Then 9-11, after it happened uh, before, uh, sorry, Ripper was passed before 9-11, uh, unlike, for example, the Patriot Act passed in response. But the UK had its own version of the Patriot Act in something called the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act 2001. And it was in part 11 of that legislation that we had the first detailed primary legislation anywhere in the world, as far as I know, specifying blanket retention of traffic data for the entire population. It came from the UK. 
The French, admittedly, were very keen on the idea too, but they didn't get around to publishing detailed regulations until many years later. Um, so I'm not going to go through uh, all of the detail of Ripper. Don't worry. I'm not going to give you that sort of uh, crash course in the detail uh, of this legislation. But I want to point out that like many other interception laws in other countries, there's two kinds of warrants. There is a domestic warrant, which is intended to be targeted for a criminal investigation, typically at a particular individual within the country. And then there is what in Ripper calls a certificated warrant, but most people would call a trawling warrant for mass surveillance. And uh, this is accomplished by positioning uh, sort of black boxes at ISPs or network exchange points, uh, or otherwise getting direct access to the fiber, the cables coming into the country. Uh, and the codification of what can be looked for lawfully is done by means of something called factors. The law talks about these factors in a very general way, sufficiently general that it could be some combination of keywords or traffic analysis or more sophisticated techniques from artificial intelligence. The law doesn't actually tell you what these factors are, but it's broad enough to encompass those ideas. Um, so the, uh, in general, these certificated trawling warrants are only supposed to be used on international communications. And an international communication is defined as one where it is both sent and received inside the country, inside the United Kingdom. That holds true even if that communication is rooted outside the UK. So if it leaves the UK and then ends up back in the UK, according to the letter of the law, it's supposed to count as a domestic communication and therefore should not be subject to these mass surveillance powers. The trouble is, when you look at the detail of the legislation, you find lots of loopholes. So essentially, if these communications which were leaving the country but coming back again, maybe an email routed through another country, uh, in practice, there is enough of a loophole to allow that to be examined under these mass surveillance powers providing perhaps it wasn't the intention to do so or it wasn't deliberately done, it's not exactly clear. Uh, oops, I'm going backwards. So one thing that is wholly new, I believe, in Ripper, and this is back in 2000, remember, is in section 16.3, there's very, very difficult to understand triple negative wording, and what it appears to do is it authorizes the government communications headquarters, the agency that does this supercomputer, mass surveillance of international communications, it allows GCHQ to look inwards, to look inwards into the UK for three months at a time, using these special search factors. So if you like, this breaks the sort of classical distinction between targeted interception for domestic stuff and mass surveillance of international communications. This appeared to cross the line and create a third type of warrant which authorizes GCHQ to use their full power to look inside the country. Now, there was a, a lot of debate about this in the House of Lords in 2000. Uh, I was advising uh, the opposition parties at the time. And in essentially, the opposition demanded and extracted a letter of clarification from the government of the day saying that, in fact, it would be illegal to use this power in the way that it apparently was drafted. So the government said, well, I suppose you could interpret this law to say that, uh, yes, GCHQ could look inside the country, but actually we didn't mean it that way, and it would be wrong if anyone did try to use it in that way. Now, it turns out you'll probably all have seen the news the past week about the riots in the UK and speculation, for example, about whether social networks could be surveilled using the powers of GCHQ. And in fact, just yesterday, there was a newspaper article speculating about the use of these powers and in fact, misdescribing what I've just told you about the scope limited to international communications. So we may see in the next few weeks, uh, this letter, which is sort of dead and buried, as far as I know, I'm one of the very few people who know about the existence of this, this will now become intensely relevant to whether social networks can be, which are obviously based in the United States, can be surveilled by a agency such as GCHQ. Meanwhile, uh, I'm sure any of you knowing about this subject at all will have read coverage 
of the so-called warrantless wiretapping affair in the United States under the Bush regime. Uh, this emerged over the course of several years, but uh, there are several strands of the story. I haven't got time to give the complete exposition now. But essentially, a technician for AT&T discovered that in one of the major switching centers of his telecommunications company, uh, essentially a tap had been created between one of the main fiber optic cables uh, carrying traffic on the west coast of the United States, and that cable had been split. And one half was being sent to a special supercomputer in a box that was obviously doing some kind of pre-filtering and then sending off the filtered product to the National Security Agency. And there have been now two or three pretty good books written about this, and it turns out that the court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court, which uh, authorizes, in this case, the National Security Agency in the US uh, to do this sort of thing to international communications, the president of that court had actually withheld material facts from the other judges. And this seems to be an extraordinary breakdown in, as it were, the judicial propriety and procedure of this most secret court uh, of all in the United States. And the substance of the argument behind the world's wiretapping affair was how hard the National Security Agency had to work to prevent collection of data about any US persons, that is, green card holders or citizens, anywhere in the world. Because the way the US regulates this area is it doesn't do uh, what the UK does, as it were, talk about international communications. It discriminates according to the nationality of the target. And I'll come back to that point, because it's extremely important for the human rights and legal analysis. So essentially, what happened around 2007 is a law was passed. I mean, it was extremely turbulent time in Congress, but a law was passed called the Protect America Act, where essentially the doctrine was changed, whereas previously the NSA would have had to work very hard to avoid collecting data about US persons. Now, essentially, it was OK to collect data about everybody, and then worry later when you access it about whether that data belongs to an American or not. And that law was consolidated a year later uh, in something called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Amendment Act 2008. And very few people have written about this. In fact, I haven't really been able to find anybody else who's written about this. Um, Section 1881 of that act authorizes surveillance of the foreign political associations of non-US persons anywhere in the world, providing that is, as it were, within US jurisdiction. And being within US jurisdiction means essentially within the reach of any corporation operated or controlled from the United States, not just a data center within the United States. And there is also an express reference including cloud computing, or as it's called in that act, remote computing facilities. When you read the definition, that is cloud computing in a nutshell. So that's obviously, that final paragraph is pretty important, and frankly, not very many people know about that. So I've got some questions that might be interesting to think about. Um, the European Convention of Human Rights, ECHR, essentially prohibits the, your, the, the application or the eligibility of your human rights according to your nationality. The point about the ECHR conception of human rights is they are universal. You can't say that this person isn't entitled to the same standard of human rights protection just because they're a different nationality. The entire US system is based on that idea. And this seems to be a staggering contradiction at the heart of international surveillance policy, which people don't actually stand back enough and say, what is all that about? Um, there's also an interesting sort of lacuna in, uh, in what is the competence of the European Union? Does data protection law, capital D, capital P, does that actually prevent any of this uh, spying by three-letter agencies? Well, the short answer is no, um, and we can have some questions about that. Um, how am I doing for time? So, totally different subject. Um, I now want to talk about data. What do we mean by personal data? What kind of data should we be regard as being important to your privacy? So the entire theory of certainly European data protection, most other privacy, information privacy laws, are built on the idea 
that we can define a certain category of data, we call it personal information or personal data, and if we protect that data, then we've protected your privacy. Because this data is supposed to be the largest set of data which could be capable of somehow affecting your privacy. So logically, if we can protect that according to certain rules, then we must have protected the person's privacy. That is the logical construction. But there's some problems that have emerged from computer science, particularly in the past uh, five or 10 years, although the original problems are deeper. Um, I'm quoting some definitions here from some quite well-known uh, authorities. Um, about what a computer scientist would say is pseudonymous today. But, I mean, it's a fairly simple idea. It's essentially when you replace somebody's name with a serial number. It doesn't have to be a random serial number. It could be a number which is referenced in some other index, or it might be a completely random number with no other association. The important thing is that if you have a group of records, then there is the same identifier associated with those records, which are records, in fact, about you. The question is, does anybody know, or can anyone statistically infer, that these bunch of records do, in fact, refer to you? So the Data Protection Directive, uh, 9546, splits up the definition of personal data into two parts. The first part, in the article, says, well, a person, uh, it's all about whether somebody is identifiable. And then it's got this pretty comprehensive uh, list of circumstances which could lead data to be identifiable. But the central question is identifiable by whom? Well, there's a bit of help. There's something called a recital, Recital 26, which is the sort of preamble to these directives, which are supposed to provide clarification. And it says, well, where you've got to protect the data if the data is identifiable, if the data can be rendered anonymous in such a way that if you consider all the means likely reasonably to be used either by the controller or by any other person to identify the person, if withstanding all of that, the data is still anonymous, well then you don't have to worry about data protection. So that's a pretty uh, watertight case. You might think, what possible problem could there be? Well, the problem is that the way European directives work is when you turn a European directive into national law, so-called transpose that, you only have to transpose the articles. You don't have to transpose the recitals. So we've got this extraordinary situation where the most fundamental term of art of data protection, namely the definition of personal data, what data protection is all about, the definition is screwed in the directive because only one half of it is mandatory to apply. So essentially what happened is the UK and Ireland wrote basically a transposition of the article. They didn't do anything about Recital 26. So what that means is that naively pseudonymized data, that is to say data which you could easily uh, re-identify by statistical means or where some other party essentially holds a key to look up the real identity of somebody, or well, they know, as it were, the real name corresponding to an index number, that sort of data is considered not personal data in the UK or Ireland. So think what that means for RFID chips, for cookie identifiers, for, uh, for MAC addresses, for IP addresses. All of those data, which I think most people in this room would agree are totally like personal data, they're extremely uh, severe consequences for your privacy, all of those kinds of pseudonymous identifiers are not considered personal data, particularly in the UK and Ireland, but you're finding, if you, if you want to try and get, uh, Germany is an honorable exception, as in many other cases in privacy, but many other countries around the EU, if you actually try and get a data protection authority to enforce your right to access data in this pseudonymous category, you'll probably have a hard time. So jumping around again to a different subject, we're back to the idea of Kia Scro. Um, this is a very brief summary of the policy as it developed in the UK. It was largely the UK, also France, but particularly the US, uh, trying to drive Kia Scro policy through. Um, what do I want to say about this? Probably 
probably not much, actually. Don't have time for that. It's kind of interesting, but too much to do. Look at the slides later. When key escrow policy failed in the UK, what the UK tried to do instead was to pass a law um, framing the circumstances under which persons in authority could demand the key or password from you. And there's a kind of, and, and there was a big uh, campaign about this in the RIP Act, and in fact there was a thousand online news articles, 15 editorials in broadsheet newspapers. Personally, I briefed uh, about 100 journalists in six months and explained asymmetric encryption, managed to get it down to about 10 minutes. Uh, and there was an unusually well-informed debate. And in fact, uh, major changes were made to these decryption powers. But how did they work? Well, there was a part of RIPA, a so-called uh, Section 49, where you could be served a notice. A policeman could come up to you and hand you this notice that would say uh, that you've got to give up a key or a password, and it could be for prevention or detection of any crime, not particularly serious crime. The power to demand this decryption would derive from the same authority that had managed to get the data. So it's different, as it were, source of authority. If a policeman picks up a USB stick in the street and thinks it belongs to you, it's a different sort of power that he invokes to do that than, say, to intercept communications. Um, and they might ask for plain text, or they might actually ask you for the key. Uh, a key can include a password as well. Um, and you can be prosecuted for failing to comply, for failing to provide this key, um, with two years in jail for, uh, shall we say, an ordinary offense. But if they suspect that the data, the encrypted data, is to do with terrorism or child protection, child pornography, then the penalty can go up to five years. So the first obvious problem is how would they know that the data is related to terrorism or child pornography if the data is encrypted? Because that's the whole point. Um, so the major problem, however, is if somebody asks you for your key, I don't know how many people here you know, use encryption on a regular basis, but whenever I try out an encryption program, I, I write some test data. Uh, I make up some nonsense passwords. And certainly, passwords uh, or keys to data that may have been around five, six years ago, uh, if somebody produced a backup of that encrypted data and asked me for the key, I'd say, I don't have that key anymore. So the original law said that once you had had possession or knowledge of a key or password, you would be assumed to have possession and knowledge of that password forevermore. So, if you could not come up with a key, the burden of proof would be on you to prove that you did not know the password, or you did not have the key. Otherwise, you go to jail. So how do you prove a negative? How do you prove that there's no corner of your bedroom, or there's no filing cabinet containing a piece of paper that does have the key written on it? How would you prove that to a court? Well, the law originally said you basically have to sort of throw yourself in the mercy of the court and say, please, 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 believe me, judge, I, I really don't know. So there's something obviously wrong about that. And um, after, again, a long argument in the House of Lords, um, I did this crypto for lawyers slides. I suspect it's not necessary for this audience. Um, this was actually amended um, in a very intricate legal way. Um, it's worth explaining because it doesn't make any sense. What the law now says is that if you're put on trial for not coming up with the key, then if your defense is that you don't have the key, you don't have possession of it any longer, or you don't know the password any longer, you have to adduce sufficient evidence to raise the issue. And if you can pass that legal threshold, then the burden of proof flips back onto the prosecution to show that you're lying beyond reasonable doubt. So the whole thing depends on this phrase, adduce sufficient evidence to raise the issue. What does that mean? Well, after 11 years, we still have absolutely no idea. Because, weirdly, having argued very, very strongly in 2000 that these decryption powers were vitally necessary to fight terrorism and child pornography, the Home Office didn't switch on this law for seven years until 2007. And in fact, there's only been a few reported cases where these powers have been used. Um, the most uh, troubling case uh, is a person called Oliver Drage, who was put on trial and given a suspended sentence in 2010. 
Um, and uh, there is a very good New Statesman article uh, written last year by a lawyer called David Allen Green. Um, and if anyone's interested in, as it were, finding out how this law can be manipulated uh, and abused, I, I really recommend looking up that article, or you can ask me a question about it. So another kind of problem that you might get with these decryption laws is, um, I want to give you a sort of case study, I don't think it's happened yet, but what I would call vampware. Uh, a virus ate my password, like a dog ate my homework. Supposing Moriarty wants to frame Alice for some heinous crime. Well, he infects Alice's machine with some memory resident code, uh, and the malware basically sort of watches until Alice is using her machine. It uses some buffer stuffing or other standard technique to change the key or password, and it phones home to Moriarty when that's successful, and then it deletes itself from memory. Moriarty then arranges a tip-off to the police. The police break down the door, seize the machine, and demand the key from Alice. So there are no forensic traces at all on Alice's machine that anything was untoward or that the key was changed without Alice knowing it. Uh, so all Alice can do is plead the theoretical possibility that a virus ate her password at trial. What evidence can Alice adduce? What actually counts as evidence in the normal criminal meaning of the word evidence? There is no evidence that can be produced here whatsoever. Um, so I think some questions that are still coming back today, there was a lot of argument about this 10 years ago, is, is there any satisfactory previous analogy to the situation of using unbreakable digital encryption? Uh, police tend to be quite fond about analysis, sort of analogies involving, imagine a house with walls made of some unbreakable substance. What sort of laws would they need in those circumstances? Well, the trouble is we don't have houses made with walls of unbreakable substances. Um, so I guess my position after this time is that I don't think this decryption power is useful. Uh, I think it has led to miscarriage of justice in the way that I did predict 10 years ago. And in fact, it doesn't really buy law enforcement anything more than they would get from ordinary contempt of court powers. So finally, um, on to data retention. Um, I've mentioned that I think the first data retention law in Europe was from the UK in Part 11 of ATCSA. Uh, it was the sort of the UK's Patriot Act response uh, to 9-11. Um, and there was a very, very long argument between both Houses of Parliament, in fact, unprecedentedly long argument, um, trying to get this wording uh, through. Um, and that's some chunks out of the actual directive. But there's one sort of staggering thing I want to point out here, which is you can see where I've highlighted the word identify. In other words, the purpose of the data retention directive is to identify people. So you might think that after the data retention directive went through in 2005, that data protection authorities would really have no alternative but to interpret IP addresses as being personal data, if it says in the data retention directive that the purpose of the directive is to identify somebody. But still, we have many data, data protection authorities around Europe who say, no, 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 just because there's other directive, it doesn't mean to say that we have to find that IP addresses, for example, are personal data. Uh, if you don't know about this, I really recommend looking at uh, the Romanian Constitutional Court decision when they struck down data retention. And um, unlike, for example, the German Constitutional Court, and I understand, for those who, who know about this, that there are special reasons why the German court uh, probably found in the way that it did. But the Romanian court decided not to find that data retention was not proportionate. They decided to say that, essentially, it was a complete head turning, sort of turning standing on its head the idea of the right to privacy under the European Convention of Human Rights. They said in rather beautiful language that the general idea in a democratic society is that one should be free from surveillance from the state, certainly from continuous surveillance of the state, unless there are specific reasons why it's permitted for the state to infringe against that. And they said that the idea of blanket data retention essentially offends against that principle. Uh, it has made the essence of the right disappear. And 
uh, I think this is the most uh, wonderful legal language that we've yet seen denouncing the idea of data retention. So to conclude, um, I hope I've shown you that there's some really worrying divergences between policy in the United States and policy in Europe. That doesn't mean to say everything in Europe is rosy, far from it. But the nature of these divergences uh, is worth looking at. Um, so for example, in the US, we see that there really isn't any constitutional protection under uh, the Fourth Amendment um, for traffic data. Uh, so far, the US courts have not recognized as it were, that, that metadata or data about communications has any privacy significance that is protected constitutionally at all. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights, since that case I mentioned Malone, it so happened that case Malone, which caused the first British interception law to be written, also laid down the idea that traffic data, or in that case it was just uh, telephone numbers, certainly does have privacy significance. And the European Court has held that in about uh, five or six other cases quite strongly since then. Um, some other differences that, that really pop out, I've mentioned already this, this really critical idea that the US discriminates its level of protection by nationality, and ECHR, that's simply not permissible. That's simply incompatible with the idea of universal human rights. Um, and there was a tremendously good paper written by a Yale law professor called Jack Balkin uh, that I really do recommend from 2008, which talks about an irreversible shift in the US to what he called a national surveillance state. There's also increasingly in the US this mantra, particularly from online advertising, saying, well, you know, too much data is being collected by every online service now, so let's, let's give up the fight on controlling collection. Let's just worry about controlling the usage. Um, we still have not seen that accepted at all in Europe, nor I hope do we, uh, and data protection authorities still are fairly robust about the idea of trying to control collection. So more sort of philosophically, I think a lot of the political discussion of these issues is all about, isn't it all a question of balance? And I like calling that the cliche of first resort because it's all about how the balance point is decided and what kind of stability you want. As scientists, we know there are many different kinds of stability. Uh, there's actually all those kinds. And the simple idea of balance is really just talking about that C one of a neutral equilibrium. What I sort of worry about, and, and a slippery slope, would be an example of an unstable equilibrium. What I worry about is this sort of situation, where if we increase the intensity of surveillance in society beyond a certain point, then we really chill the willingness of an intelligentsia to engage in lawful democratic dissent. If you are not happy with the activities of the political party that you traditionally supported. Maybe you want to form a different party. Maybe you want to depose the leadership. Everyone's got a career. The more you move up in your career, if you're a senior lawyer, a senior policy official, you have to watch out for what people will think about you. So we might reach a point in society where we decide not to send that email, not to pick up a telephone to call that political colleague, not to make trouble at the next meeting of whatever civil institution we belong to because the ruling leadership of that institution is too powerful. And you never know, they might get to hear from these blanket surveillance practices that they have a dissident on their hands. And that's rather a different and more subtle effect, I believe, than the uh, very familiar idea now of the panopticon. So that's about it. Um, I hope that's been interesting, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Kaspar. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, please uh, line up at the microphone. Someone's coming up. 
just got one question in regards to the question, uh, the laws in the UK where uh, the government or uh, in a legal case you can be forced to uh, release your passwords. Uh, what about scenarios if like, you know, I want to encrypt some data, but uh, I don't know, I asked a foreign friend to actually put in the password, so I don't actually never know the password. He encrypts it for me, and I can also prove that, that he's done that, but he is actually not other, under the jurisdiction of the UK. I mean, what would happen in those cases are things I could think of several ways where you can actually probably easily probe and get around it if you really want to, uh, which I guess then in return defeats the whole purpose of the law. So has that been discussed? It's a very good question. Um, I mean, there, there seem to be two elements of that question. One is that with asymmetric encryption, of course, it may be the case that if I uh, encrypt a message to you, then I may not be able to decrypt that message. Only you can decrypt that message. And then the other part of the question is, uh, so in some sense, Ripper takes care of that because, and in fact, this is a concession that was won very early on in the Ripper debate, is the government conceded that they do have to prove that at some point you did know the key. So they do have to prove that you did possess the key or the password at some point. But the other part of the question is, can Ripper, as it were, reach outside the UK? Could, for example, a company officer or a company operating in the UK, could that company officer, uh, in fact, be uh, put in jeopardy, uh, even if their parent company was outside the UK? The short answer is we don't know. I don't think that has been tested. Uh, I am aware of pressure that's being applied informally to major internet companies to, uh, to satisfy these kind of decryption uh, requests, but that hasn't really reached uh, the public sphere. Um, but it's certainly a question that is worrying many people in the internet industry um, at the moment. There was one um, amendment which uh, I did manage to achieve, which was originally uh, Ripper did say that if you are a, a, an officer of a company, you know, a member of the board, um, then if you did not take sufficient action to make sure that key requests could be complied with, then you could be criminally culpable. So I coined a phrase for that of key escrow by intimidation. Um, and that seemed to kill off that idea. So we did get an amendment which at least chopped that up. Any other questions? Hello. Uh, I just wanted to know, does it make any difference anyhow, the um, different rules between the US and Europe in times of the collaboration of law enforcement agencies with each other, the exchange of information, what is not um, retrievable under one set of law could be retrievable under the other set of law and then exchanged by our inter-official uh, some kind of uh, partnership programs, something like that? So that's a very good question again. Um, there is, as a very live subject of discussion in Brussels at the moment, uh, discussion of a so-called framework agreement between the EU and the US, which would allow uh, EU data uh, about, about EU citizens to be passed to the US uh, for law enforcement purposes. And then this framework agreement was supposed to, as it were, then nail down the circumstances, what it could be used for. Um, the, I'm not the, the expert on this, and, and certainly a lot of the detailed negotiations are not publicly known, but what I have heard about this is the US is not giving any guarantees whatsoever uh, that this data would be, as it were, confined for some specific purpose. Pretty much once that data has gone, it's gone, uh, and there are very few meaningful guarantees being offered. So it all depends, sorry. So it all depends on the weakest uh, link in the chain? Yes. Hi, uh, Daniel Solo, who is a uh, American professor of law, and his book, uh, Nothing to Hide, says that the problem is not our world, but Kafka. Uh, what do you think of this kind of uh, thinking, the surveillance uh, society debate? Um, so, uh, I, do, I do have some um, reservations about other of Solo's positions, but that, that, I think, is a good characterization, although I'd say it's probably not, it's, it's probably a bit of both. Um, I think it, it is wise for Solov, though, to point out that uh, one of the aspects that we, I, could, I certainly have described uh, about the UK law as Kafkaesque is the sheer complexity of the rights or, or is it for the individual to exercise their rights. Um, this is 
in something called the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. It's essentially who you complain to if you think your human rights have been infringed, not just the right to privacy, potentially other rights, by the laws I've described. And uh, it has these extraordinary Kafkaesque procedures about what you're not allowed to know. So as a complainant, you're not allowed to know essentially anything about how your case is being considered, or indeed whether the people considering your complaint have actually understood your complaint or, or dealt with it in an appropriate way. You're really allowed to know nothing about that. And there's an incredibly detailed uh, set of rules, which uh, there is no other word for it, is Kafkaesque. Um, on the other hand, I do think we should be worried about Orwell. Uh, and I don't think, as it were, Orwell in the sense of a, um, uh, a massive and efficient state apparatus, which is using these powers uh, in progressively more uh, abusive fashion. I still, still think that is a, a reasonable risk to worry about in the future. Hi, thanks for the talk. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I'm from the UK. I wondered what your thoughts were about what the future might hold in terms of Ripper um, and how it's going to be used or how it may develop. Um, yeah, and so on in the future. It's a great question. Well, um, when the current government was elected, uh, as you know, it's a coalition government, and uh, they hammered out a coalition agreement. And the most interesting line in that coalition agreement for me is there was a promise, straightforward promise as a platform of the current government to end the retention of communications data without good reason, which I think is about as cast iron as you could get. So uh, although the coalition seems to be making progress on many other of their pledges in the manifesto, um, they're doing absolutely nothing about that. And uh, the only two utterances about that which have stirred in the press suggest that uh, ministers have no intention of honoring that coalition agreement. And I also, at a conference, uh, was able to ask the current Attorney General uh, what he thought about some of the interception powers I mentioned, particularly the thing about GCHQ being able to look inward. Now, I don't think, to be fair to him, he was actually aware of the uh, problems that I pointed out to you. But he was very blase and dismissive and said, oh, I don't think that's anyone. People are worried about phone hacking. People aren't worried about this at all, Casper. So I don't see the government going to do uh, anything about this unless we have a real life scandal which puts those parts I've talked about, as it were, in the frame of publicity. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Also, there doesn't seem to be anything coming in from the internet, so Thanks a lot, Casper, for the talk. One more round of applause for him.